So welcome to this latest episode of MQ's Open Mind. Work. Craig and I are absolutely delighted today. We've got the fantastic Alistair Campbell. Alistair obviously is known to, I think, most people in the world, I think, at this stage, Alistair. Obviously known for being Tony Blair's chief strategist and spokesperson, best-selling author, journalist, and obviously now it seems to be world-leading podcaster. I see the number of posts I see of your Al- Alistair where you're Number one, two, three, and four in the top list. So yeah, no, obviously... I've got to, I, I've got to stop boasting. It's really bad. <laughs> I just can't. Every time it's one, two, three, I can't resist it. <laughs> but obviously, for those of you who haven't heard of Alistair's podcast with Rory Stewart, it's obviously the rest is politics, which is a fantastic listen. So I'm great. Like how this came about it was that Alistair and I were speaking at the same event in Sheffield. Actually, the launch of the the Baton of Hope conference. And I used the opportunity to ask Alistair, would he very kindly join our podcast, which he very graciously did. So, Alistair, thanks a million. Um, pleasure. MQ. Absolutely and then pleasure. the other thing, just before we get into the bits and pieces of it, is so those of you who are watching us, this is our MQ's Your Mental Health book, um, which we, when did that come out last year? Was that last year it came out? Yeah, but we're actually last... selling it on our website at this moment. And all <laughs> proceeds go straight to MQ. MQ. So, but Alistair very kindly has, there's obviously a bit of your stories in this, Alistair, and a photograph of you. And um, so, again, thanks to William for contributing to MQ Mental Health, which is for those of you who are listening and don't know, it's only dedicated mental health research charity in the UK. And we're really trying to drive forward understanding through research. And one of our strap lines is without research, what we're doing is just guesswork. So, that's my sort of, sort of promo out of the way for MQ. So Alistair, what we try and do is really start at the beginning and, and we'll also talk about your book, Living Better. But maybe tell us a bit, I obviously know a lot about your history, but maybe start at the beginning about your story and really how I know you're very, obviously your, your brother's experiences really led your, your impetus to be involved in mental health. But maybe a bit about your history first, please. Okay, born 67 years ago in Yorkshire, dad a vet, mum a housewife once the kids started to come. And a mother grew up in Yorkshire till I was about 11, then moved to Leicester, then went to Cambridge, drifted a bit, became a journalist, then went and worked for Tony Blair on the mental health journey. The rest, as you, as you know, you've sort of alluded to on the mental health journey. I would say, yeah, my first really big experience and understanding of it or attempt to understand of it was when my brother Donald was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I'd be in my late teens. He was in his early 20s. He was in the military, in the Scots Guards. And we just got a phone call saying he was in a military psychiatric hospital. Went down with my dad, place near Southampton. The place is shut now. And it was just, you know, my dad, as I say, was a vet. But even though that's sort of quasi-scientific background, we didn't know anything about schizophrenia, Mm -hmm. nothing. We knew Jekyll and Hyde. We knew split personality we knew all the kind of cliches we knew nothing and it was a very i'm not blaming anybody for this because it was the military but it was a pretty austere environment to be fair to them they allowed me to stay i was able to stay with him for quite a long time while he was in hospital but our lives in many ways became defined by that my mum's life definitely i remember she said not long before she died she said the thing is about my life changed when we got that phone call about Donald and it never changed back again. Now, she was a wonderful mother and he was a great guy. Um, he was a very good musician. He was a piper. He was funny. He was smart. And he actually had a pretty good life considering the condition. Eventually, he got a, a re, you know a pretty good job that he enjoyed. He did it for 27 years. Glasgow University is a yeah. security guy and working in the library. And they knew all about his illness. They knew that, like a lot of people on on antipsychotics, it was when he stopped taking them because he felt good that he then would relapse. And so we had, you know, when he died, he died age 62. And I'm sure that's a familiar story to you, 20 years younger than my dad. When he died, we, my sister and I sort of, we went, put little dots on every place in the UK where we'd had to be, to go visit him in hospitals at different points. But through all that, he, he had a, he had a pretty good life and, and, but it was just such a horrible illness. And, you know, what's so brilliant about what you guys do, I think that, you know, I, I really campaign on this on the kind of awareness side of things and 
money in government and that sort of stuff. But I think the research thing is so important because the truth is the drugs that Donald was on didn't much change from the word yeah. go. The treatments didn't much change. And I just don't think people care about it that much. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there's, well, there's, lot, there's positives and obviously less positives than that, Alistair, obviously, because I think that, well, first thing to say, I suppose, is um, I'm sitting here at Glasgow University, obviously, and Donald was playing the pipes. Yeah. Obviously, up the hill, uh, five minutes from me here, and and actually, one well, I, I was reading, I reread your obituary to Donald, actually, which you wrote, um, obviously, and the last time you played the pipes properly together was was it was there? You know, yeah. was there Charles Kennedy's funeral? That's absolutely right. It was um, so Charles Kennedy was quite a good friend of mine, and he'd been rector of the university, so knew Donald very well because Donald played at all the graduations, all the yeah, dinners. Yeah. He had a good relationship with Charles, and. But he wasn't well when, when there was the big send-off for Charles at the university after he died. But he was determined to play. So I said, well, look, I'll play with you. I'll bring the pipes as well. I'll I'll play with you. And, mm -hmm. you know, let's just see how it goes. And, you know, the quadrant, you come down the steps from the where the, the whole the big ceremony was. And, and actually, if you go there now, I don't know if you've seen it. But there's a, we, my nephews, when he died, my nephews and nieces, they... They clubbed together to get a portrait done of Donald, which is there on the stage. Seen it, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, he walked around. He was about a third of the way around the quadrangle. And he just stopped, and you can actually see in the pictures that were taken at the time. You can see he's really ill, mm -hmm. and he died not that long afterwards. So yeah, that was the that was the last time he played the pipes, mm -hmm. I think, because after that he went on to the electronics. Yeah, yeah. No, because when I was reading up about the experience of, of Donald and obviously his influence, of course, on on your life was. The, well, two things struck me. What you just said, one was the fact is that you were allowed to stay with him at those those early days when he was in hospital. I mean, what when was what what's what year was that? Well, that was so I would have been 18, 19, uh, 70s, 70, 70s, yeah. yeah. And yeah. the thing, the thing, when I, I didn't stay overnight, mm -hmm. but I was in there during the day and yeah. they let me hang around with him in the there was this sort of mess mess room with all the yeah um, and there was some there were some really really fascinating characters there and this was a time by the way when the military had a bit of a problem with people you know you could buy your way out of the military right but you had to pay but one of the ways to get out without paying was to was to say you were sick so there was a little bit of suspicion there was some of that going on not with donald because he was really seriously ill but with some other people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just this, it was a fascinating, it, it was like, I think I said in the book, um, Living Better, I think I said it was like, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest in uniform. It was just, because mm -hmm. they still had to wear uniform. Yeah, uh, yeah. But they weren't bad people. I mean, they, you know, the treatment wasn't terrible. It was just, it was just of its age. Yeah, yeah. It was of its and, age. And I suppose the question is, to what extent have we moved forward in the treatment of mental, serious mental health problems? There have been, there has been progress, but, one of the statistics we often talk about here at MQ is if you compare people, the number of people per person affected by mental health problems, right? And look at the research funding that goes into oh. that. But compare that to, for example, per, per person affected by, say, physical health problems like cancer. And I'm not yeah. saying phone cancer, but but the, 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 start, the differential is remarkable. It's 25 times more research funding goes into cancer research per person affected compared to mental health research. Now, it's, it's got a bit better in the last 10 or 15 years, but we really are start, starting from such a distance back, the journey to really prioritize research and service. Just give, give, me that, give me that start again. The funding refers, invested in mental health research, per person affected. You compare yeah. that to cancer research, per person affected. There's 25 times difference. Yeah, And yeah. so that was work that MQ commissioned and led on a few years ago, looking at what was known as a research landscaping activity to try and look at what was going on out there. So that's stark. I mean, that's just... Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story that relates to that because I think this is important. And it's about... I think I said this in the... I, I might have mentioned this in the speech that I did at Sheffield at that event, which was an amazing event, by the way. Yeah, it was great. It really was. Except um, you missed me, obviously, but apart from that. Yeah, but, you know, I, lived, I survived. I survived. <laughs> <laughs> I heard all about it. That's why I agreed to do this. Um, <laughs> the thing is that when I think I told the story that when I was a child, and it was before we left Heathley, so it was before I was 11 or 10, and my mum sat us all down, me, my two brothers and my sister, and said that our neighbour had got cancer. And she said, you mustn't tell people. And I'll never forget that. And... If you think about it, and younger listeners to this will just think, well, what's the guy talking about? 
but there was a taboo around cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. The newspapers called it the big C. Well, we've still got taboo around mental health. And I think that's one of the reasons why there is this reluctance to get behind it as a cause. I mean, you know, we, I, 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 I enjoy talking about mental health. I enjoy campaigning on mental health. But the truth is, we're still a pretty small number of people who do this. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, cancer, the, I'm not criticizing the cancer charities. I've worked with the cancer charities. I was chairman of fundraising for the main blood cancer charity for years. But it's an easier job to do to get research for cancer or for asthma or for diabetes yeah. or for any of the, you know, the big killers. And when you have a situation in this country where suicide is now the biggest killer of young men in particular, if you imagined deleting the word suicide and inserting any illness, any other illness, don't tell me that there wouldn't be a greater urgency about. Oh, I mean, I mean, you're speaking yours. to the converted here. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. And I often actually, I make that comparison when I give talks and write about it. I talk about, yeah, 20 years ago, we had cancer as the big C, but in the work that I do on suicide, suicide's the big S. So yeah, good one. Oh, that's two good lines you've given me. I'll steal these. <laughs> yeah, big S. I like it. But no, but what? But 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 the serious point is that um, I did a, I did a poll actually on Twitter a few years ago, and I was asking people why do you not why do you think we don't we have this differential? And so yeah, number one was what you said there, Alistair, is the stigma. So basically, people said I don't want to I don't want to this this was about five or six years ago. People saying I don't want to run on a marathon for a mental health charity. That was some people were telling us this because of the yeah. stigma. And yeah. for suicide particularly, now that is changing, thankfully. Yeah, and then the other one is linked to people, too many people think that mental health problems and suicide are not preventable or not treatable. Mm. They still think that. So mm. I think we still, whereas as you say, with diabetes, cancer, or anything else, these charities, are, I mean, they do an amazing job. And it's not that we in the mental health sector don't, but we really are still knocking at a, a door which isn't fully open yet. Yeah. No, I think the, the, the stigma goes goes deep and it, and it goes back to this, you know, a lot of it goes back to history. I mentioned, I've already mentioned Jekyll and Hyde and One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. Why? Because they both still define yeah. how a lot of people think about mental health and mental illness. So I think that, but I, I, you know, I think you've just got to keep going. I think eventually, look, eventually the cancer taboo did go. Yeah, yeah. And it means now, but I was thinking this, you know, I, I, I was the other night we were, we were just out walking near us in Belsize Park and there was a guy there who was clearly very mentally ill. He was he, when we first saw him, it looked like he was taking drugs off a bin, but he wasn't. He was actually sort of just like talking to cigarette butts or something that was on the on the top of this bin. And because I've kind of, you know, seen stuff like this and been around it, I felt no compunction, no qualms about going over and just saying, hey, are you okay? And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, how are you doing and stuff like that. But I could see from the reaction of some of the people who was just outside the tube station, go, Oh, what are you doing? Yeah. Now, if you think about you're on, let's say you're on a train and somebody gets on, and let's say it's a woman and she's completely bald and she's looking a bit gaunt, right? You know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know what's going on. And <laughs> nine times out of ten, most people, they're not gonna feel threatened or embarrassed yeah or they're not going to think it's difficult to start a conversation whereas i think with mental illness we still do you know i feel sometimes when we, we've all got it when in families and friendship groups and so forth that i still feel that i'm not as good as i should be given all i know mm -hmm. dealing with stuff close to me mm -hmm. because it's hard it's hard yeah. it's 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 like you know even though i've been through addiction been through psychosis been through depression seen my brother the way that he was, seen other people, known people who've taken their own lives. When you're sort of confronted with it, we're not, because I think the other thing about cancer, you and I have got no doubt that we could not fix somebody's cancer. But you and I both think, you know what, we probably could fix that guy. Yeah. And the truth is, because when you're in, confronted with it, you realize you can't. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of adds to this layer of don't quite know what to say, don't quite know what to do, don't quite know how to handle it. Yeah, but no, I agree with that. But I suppose I think there's another bit as well, which is we there's still more we can do to equip people to oh yeah um, to support people who are, if you're living with somebody who's got mental illness or mental health problems, it, it, part of it is even is acknowledging how difficult it is, right? Yeah. But there's some skills we can help people and and support people, and actually just slightly unrelated is. 
I just watched last night Ed Davies, um, yeah. party political broadcast again. Ed Davies, leader of um, the Liberal Democrats, and he just posted this amazing video talking about of, of trying to highlight the role of carers, given that he is a, a care of his son. And I mean, my God, that was just so powerful. But I, was. what I liked about it though was, or I liked it at many different levels, but part of it was actually acknowledging this is difficult. In the same way, it's really difficult to care with people often with mental health problems. And and, and I think part of it, we acknowledge that, you can start to move forward and maybe yeah, get yeah, yeah. what you need. Yeah. No, I, th I, I thought it was obviously an election period. So I, I thought it was a, uh... I did think it was a very, very powerful thing. And Frank, because we've interviewed Ed Davey, Ed Davey about, uh, on the podcast, mm -hmm. we, when we talked a lot about his experience, both with his mother, with his son in particular. Ah, his father, his father died young as well. Yeah, no, no, his father died young, but also he was a carer, I think, for his mum. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now his son, and, 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 and I know his wife's got health challenges as well. And it was just so, it's so authentic. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and it was really, really moving to hear him talk about it. Um, and the thing he said, I don't know, I don't think he said this in the film, but he said when we were talking to him, the thing that, that really keeps him awake at night is who's going to look after his son when he's gone. Yeah. They've gone. And, you know, I think that, but, but, but I was, that, that was, um, that was one of my mother's and, and my dad's real worries. Now, as it happens, you know, they, they, my mum and my brother died not, not that far apart, mm -hmm. but, you know, she was really, really worried about what would happen. Yeah. After, after after she died, as it happens, he took it, you know, reasonably well. But yeah, I th I think, but I think the re the research, the the fact that cancer research has advanced so much, yeah. the fact the fact we got a bloody vaccine so quickly, yeah, yeah. When policymakers and governments and the health authorities decide that something is urgent, it happens. So what this means is that over decades we haven't really decided that this is urgent. Yeah. Well, how can it not be urgent when, as I said earlier, the big S is the biggest killer? There's a good line. For, there's a good line for your next talk. Just another stat on on that, which links really this trying to make this argument though. Alistair is so. Of course, it's the moral, ethical, the right thing to do to try and prevent human suffering, and in the work that I do to trying to prevent suicide. But statistically, there's an economic argument as well. Totally, yeah, totally. Every totally. suicide costs about, on average, one and a half million. Yeah. One and a half million. And you think about the fact then that there are what six thousand deaths by suicide across the UK each year. One and a half million. So that the investment it saves money in the long term, and it's the right thing to do. Sorry, Craig, you're trying to come in there. Yeah, just to jump onto what you were saying. Considering in fact like the stats, and I guess it's kind of getting old at this point. One in four people will experience a mental health issue in their life. Why do you think there's not enough being done? If it, if it is a case where there is money being pumped into a vaccine and there's so many people being affected, why do you think that's the case? Well, the first thing, just just let me go off on a tangent first. I don't like the one in four thing anymore mm. because I think it understates. And also I think it there's a danger that it also stigmatizes a bit because I think the argument we should use is that one in one of us has mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right. We're not all mentally ill and some of us never will be. Right. But one in one of us has got mental health. I think the reason why it's not, you know, up where it should be is because these arguments haven't been won. And, and I think that goes back to the history, goes back to the taboo. It goes back to the fear. It goes back to the fact that it's so difficult. And it goes to the fact that in when you I mean, the health service get, you know, it, about four in every 10 pounds that we put into the exchequer goes on health. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're not spending a lot of money on health, but it goes on hospitals, it goes on drugs, it goes on nurses, it goes on doctors, it goes on beds, it goes on cancer, it goes on the big, what we define as the big killers. Mental health has never managed to get itself into that place where it's seen as one of the big things. And I think one of the reasons, and this is why I'm quite encouraged by the way that both Labour and the Lib Dems, I think, are trying to change the debate within the health sector is actually... We've got to take a far more preventative approach to this. You know, this idea about mental health support in schools and mental health hubs in every community. Mm. You know, the reason why you get to the cost of 1.5 million, it's not just the cost of the suicide, it's, it's, it's the costs that are included in the run-up to that. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I, not far from where I live, there's Pentonville Prison, and I go in sometimes to work with the see the mental health team in there who do an amazing job, absolutely run off their feet, some terrible situations that they're having to deal with 
you, okay, within any prison, you're going to find some very, very bad people. But the truth is, in the main, you find people that when you talk to them, you think, oh, my God, if only they'd have got a bit of help then. Mm -hmm. If they'd only got a bit of help when that happened. And you find that so many of them, when you really boil down what's going on inside them, it's a mental health problem. They've got mm -hmm. a mental health problem. Well, it's not going to get fixed in prison. Well, you have to take a systemic approach as well. I mean, that's the whole... So, yeah, the, the preventive approach has to deal with inequalities. So if you look more broadly, you're four times more, three times more likely to die by suicide you're, if you're from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds. You're much more likely to experience mental health problems if you're from a socially disadvantaged background. If you're ethnic minority pop population, depending on which outcomes you're looking at, you're more likely to die younger. That There's a whole host of stuff which require systemic change, and that is at all levels. Like starting with, one of the things we're hoping to talk about is the work of, on the Sure Start program, right? So yeah. we think back to, I think it was introduced by, it was Gordon Brown's idea, I think, introduced by Tessel Joyle, I think, in 1998. So the Sure Start program, which is an amazing initiative, to really try to support families from basically perinatal just before birth through to and going to school. And it was again trying to provide practical support as well as mental health and physical health support. And of course, sadly, over the last number of years, in particular, I think since 2010, there's been a huge decrease. I think there's over, I think there's now 1,500 fewer Sure Start centres across the UK than there were. And so I think that that sort of stuff would address the issue you're talking about, Alistair. Mm. Absolutely. No, that, you know, there's there's lots of things that I get really angry about with this government. But I think getting rid of Sure Start was one of them. That's exactly what I mean about preventive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't a mental health initiative, but mental health was part of it. Yeah. It was basically acknowledging that if you were a single mum listening, living in a really, really challenging area with not much money, and then you're going to find life a lot tougher. Well, if you get a little bit of support at that time, the chances are you'll survive better and your kids are going to survive better. And I think that's what we've got to get. It's going to be hard, but I think that's the approach we've got to get back to. Yeah, but I think we haven't had enough, though. And I've been listening to all the debates, right? So, and every every discussion I've pretty clued into the election, and I've hardly heard, heard, heard mental health mentioned by any party at any part of the UK. And that, and that depresses me because I really hoped we would, try, we would start to see mental health pushed up the agenda. Yeah, we need your help, Alistair. Well, I try my best. We we did um, an interview with West Streeting the other day, Shadow Health Secretary. We did talk a lot about mental health, but that was because I was asking him. I don't know, mm. but he was making the point that this this is like you know we've got to get this, we've got to change the lens and see this is a part of the economic argument you were making, but also this thing about prevention being better than cure because once you get to the cure stage, it's a lot harder. Mm. It's just so much stuff is kind of you know deep wide into people. Yeah, but I suppose also the other thing is that the other bit is even when you get to the cure stage or the intervention, the crisis stage, the other difficulty we have is, yes, I agree that the advances we've seen in cancer research, the advances we've seen in vaccines and so on has been great. There also have been advances in mental health treatments, but the implementation has been problematic is that people can't get access to the treatments. Yeah. And that's the issue. And there's, the waiting lists are too long, child and adolescent mental health services. My God, there's still too many people. Young people are waiting over a year. Oh, the, the 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 cam the cam stuff alone, and and the fact that it's kind of almost accepted, is the thing that I find absolutely terrifying. And it's also the thing. Let's be honest. It's also the thing that is pushing more and more people to the private sector to the understanding yeah, yeah. that's the only place you're going to get help. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there is a part of me that thinks that's been a deliberate strategy. Well, that's just heartbreaking if that's the case, obviously. But the reality is that too many of our young people in particular, especially even suicidal young people, and suicidal thoughts don't wait for anybody. I mean, it's just they don't wait for a waiting list and no. we need the help now. Alistair, can I bring you back? Because we thought that was a bit of a tangent, but I was just going to bring you back to Donald and your own experience of mental health. Is One of the things that I think I remember reading in your book was that the, a couple of things struck me. One was actually at the start of the book and one about from the end of the book. From the end of the book was Fiona, your wife, saying you wish she wished you had a go, gone for help earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand why you didn't do the, go for help earlier. And then the other bit is that, again, thinking, I think you talk about that, when you mentioned that experience of visiting Donald for those, those that early time in hospital, how then when you were in therapy many years later, I think, that was an issue which came up as a really important event for you. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Can you can talk about both of those, please. 
Yeah, I think on the first one, I mean, what happened with me is that I'd never really th viewed myself as having mental health problems. I, I, I was aware of having quite a volatile temper. I was aware of, you know, occasionally being sad, but lots of people get sad. Um, I was definitely aware of drinking too much, but I thought I could handle it. And then in 1986, I had this kind of, not far from where you are now, in, in um, Hamilton, and ended up in a hospital in Paisley, where I just had a kind of complete meltdown, psychotic, mm. paranoid. And the thing is that r coming out of the hospital, I made several quite big decisions. I decided I wouldn't drink. I decided to take time off. I decided to sort myself out as well as I could. And I think by not drinking, which I didn't touch it for 13 years, I think I persuaded myself that I'd done what I needed to do. And then when the depressions kept coming, particularly later on, by then I just thought, well, that's just the way it is. I can get through. I just sort of tough it out. And that's kind of what I did. And then, of course, I ended up working in politics and and all that and just never got around to it in a way. Mm -hmm. And so it was only really, as I said in the book, it was only really in 2005 that I realized I had to get help. Fun enough, tomorrow I'm speaking at the funeral of the guy that I mentioned in the book, my psychiatrist. He died recently. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, really sad. So I'm speaking at that. And it well, was Dr. Bammy, was it? No, no, that was he was the guy in Paisley. He's, he's, al he's already died. Um, David Sturgeon was the guy. Oh, down, David, yeah. yeah, yeah, David Sturgeon. Uh, yeah. That I saw in 2005. So I think it was a sort of, I think it was almost like a, oh, I've done it. I've, I've cracked it. I've done it because I stopped drinking. Mm -hmm. But I think actually the drink was a, was a, what I was using at that time to cover up the depression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Depression didn't go away. So I had, you know, other addictions like, you know, work or exercise or football or you know, bagpipes, yeah. whatever it might be, um, writing, you know, anything. And then on Donald, it's very hard to know because the truth is, you know, we give our we give ourselves our own live narratives, don't we? So when you said to me, tell us your story a bit, and I, you know, started with birth and then we removed and then you know, you, you've got your key moments. Yeah, but yeah. I do think that was a seminal moment because, and I said in the book, I think I always had a bit of survivor guilt. I always thought it was deeply unfair that I had this sort of amazing life and nice house and traveled the world and had amazing experiences and power and all that stuff and I'm not short of a few bob. And, you know, and Donald had a really tough life, you know, yeah. and you think, well, why? That's not fair. My other brother did as well for different reasons. So there was definitely a bit of that. But it's but the other thing is there's no doubt that was when I became that place, Netley, the hospital was I became fascinated by mental illness. Mm -hmm. Um and I always have been. Yeah. In terms of the discussion with the psychiatrist, am I right remembering though that this sort of bubbled up in one of your early sessions that you hadn't recognized it until much later that the impact of that those that early experience of seeing them in a mental health institution. I think I hadn't articulated it. So the survivor guilt was you had that, but hadn't got the words for it until later on. Yeah, and also the other thing I had was uh, the other guilt I had was feeling that I could have done more. I think we always get that. Yeah. And there were times that, you know, you'll, you'll know people like this. There were times when, you know, particularly if Donald was on a bit of a kind of, you know, flying high, he just wouldn't stop phoning me. You know, the phone would go, you put the phone down, and it'd be often absolutely, yeah. you know, nothing. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you drive me mad. Tough, and, uh, it's tough. Yeah. You know, so, and so I, I sometimes think back to those moments when I thought, oh, I should have spent more time, I should have listened more. But he would literally, he'd phone me sometimes, honestly, I'd be phoning and, and I'd always, you're not, about, you're not about to have your phone inside Downing Street, but phone would go and I'd, and I'd be, it might be in a meeting with Tony Blair or Gordon Brown. And of course, you never know, because it could be urgent, right? Phones go in and I answer the phone. I go, Donald, I'm just in a meeting. It's important. No, 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 it's all right. Who are you with? I said, I'm with Tony. Oh, okay, give us a ring when you finish. We'll find out. Two minutes later, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, you can understand. <laughs> you can understand. You want to know, obviously. Yeah, no, it was sort of difficult to deal with at times. No, of course, of course. But then, so let, just moving on then, Alistair, one of the things that really struck me when you uh, give the talk in Sheffield, a couple of things did. One was, and, and you talk about it in the book as well, and uh, is your, your mental health scale. Because mm -hmm. so I, I found it just a really helpful thing, especially the one in 10 thing. Mm. Maybe it would be really helpful if you could talk us through that. 
Cool. I can't even remember where I started doing this, but essentially what it is is that every morning when I wake up, one of the first things I say to myself, sometimes I'm brushing my teeth or I'm walking down the stairs, or or if I'm bad, when I'm lying in bed, and it'll be right, what number are you today? And a lot of people think I've got this the wrong way around. They think that I've got the one yeah. at the wrong end and the 10 at the wrong end. So my one is the, 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 a state of happiness that doesn't exist, okay? Trump doesn't exist. Boris Johnson never existed. Burnley just won the Champions League again, not Real Madrid. You know, it doesn't exist. Two is manic, bit out of control, really got to watch yourself. Three and four are where I like to be, really energetic, feel I've got a lot to do. Kids are getting on. Fiona and I are getting on. The dog's happy. Um, the weather's okay. Uh, everything feels good. I've got a purpose. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Energy. I feel I can give something and get something out of it. Five is when I start to think, mm. you know, this is what most people's lives like. It's just a bit dull. It's just sort mm. of going down the middle. Six is when I'm starting to feel a bit depressed. Seven is when I'm really feeling low. Eight is when I'm struggling to get out of bed. Nine is when I can't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And 10 is suicide. So that's why I have the one and 10 deliberately, almost like I'm never going to go there. I'm yeah, determined yeah. never, because that doesn't exist. Therefore, for me, that's not going to exist either. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I've got very, very close when I've been eight and nine. But what the reason is matters to me is that I can I can sometimes move myself up the scale. I, so I've got lots of little things that I do. So if I'm, say, on six or seven, I don't listen to the news. I listen to music. It makes me feel better. I know the things that will make me feel worse, and I know the things that will make me feel better. And I really try, I don't always succeed, but I really try to focus on the things that I know will make me feel better. So if I'm on a, and, and then I've got little things like there's a, I said in the book, there's a, there's a landing on the way down from our bedroom and there's a blind there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, you know, if I'm on a three and four, I'll just run down the stairs. If I'm on a six and a seven, I'll make sure I lift the blind. And it's almost like a way of saying, right, I can do that. You know, mm -hmm. you'll know loads of people who find it really difficult to brush their teeth and shave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they're depressed, well, I, I, I always do that. Mm -hmm. Always shave. I always brush my teeth. I haven't shaved. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so these are little things, and then I'll give myself a little mark, and I'll say, right, you've moved up a third of a point. Mm -hmm. And then if I go back, I go back, and then I think of something else, and I try and push myself along. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it just it's hopeless. But you know, and then all I do is have time and I say, okay. That hasn't worked, but let's just let time take it on. Yeah, no, no I was so impressed by it because you also, you, 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 in addition to those examples you gave, you've other things you suggest, obviously exercise and things and which you help you get through the day or other sort of ways you talk about when you were in Downing Street, how you, um, a, small, a very small number of people, one or two people could really sense what was going on and then would sort of protect you in a way. Yeah. In those difficult times. The the the, the, other, the other bit, obviously, in the book uh, is the jam jar. So do you want to tell us about the jam jar? So the jam jar, where is my jam jar? It's, oh, I've just said this. Oh, there it is. Shall I go and get it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Get the jam jar. <laughs> get the jam jar. No taking the piss out of my clothes. <laughs> so Alice is wearing shorts, everybody. For those of you who can't see this and you can't hear us either. Oh, wait, so you've actually got, he's actually got, Alistair's coming back now with a real jam jar. So I was just, I was just given, I was just given our, our viewers, our, our listeners, sorry, a commentary on your attire there, Alistair. Well, <laughs> well I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the exercise, see. I'm <laughs> out of here in 16 minutes and I'm going for a swim. So there's a jam jar. Yep. And this was given to me by a woman in Canada who was a genealogist, sorry, who was a geneticist. And it was when I was, I write about it in the book, when I was exploring the idea of her, the hereditary elements to mental illness, which aren't that. They're, they're not as they are. Her, her short answer was, it's not hereditary. Okay. However, it's more complicated than that. When we finished the interview, she said, so how do you deal with your depression? And I said, well, I take pills and I see this guy, David. Oh, she because I get depressed. And I was, you know, I'm normally good at spotting depressors, but I didn't spot it in her at all. And she said, I said, well, how do you deal with it? She said, I've got a jam jar. 
I said, what's your jam jar? He said, well, my jam jar basically is my life. So in my jam jar, down the bottom is a sediment, and that's your genes. Nothing you can do. And your life, your jam jar fills up with millions of experiences. Most of them we just forget. They have no impact. They just go. The ones that stay in can be good. You know, you passed your driving test. You, you got your A-levels. You got a, through your interview. You fell in love. You had a kid. You got a car, you had a nice holiday, stuff goes in, you won elections, you know, good stuff stays in, but bad stuff stays in as well. And it all mixes around. And most of the time, most people just about cope. But she says, sometimes the, the jar fills to overflowing and it mm -hmm. explodes. And when it explodes, we're ill. Okay. And she said, the thing is that I've learned is that instead of trying to undo everything in the jam jar, grow the jam jar, so as you can put more of your own life into it. And this goes back to something I said earlier. So my jam jar now consists of, so the, the biggest component is FFF, Fiona, family, friends, friendship, and your relation, key relationships. Then it's for me, MA, meaningful activity. Mm -hmm. Then it's stuff like fundamentals, sleep, diet, exercise. Then it's things that are personal, bagpipes, Burnley, my bike, my dog, my books, mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, then it's stuff that's kind of creative. You know, I have to write every day. So there's writing, there's music. And then, so I'm going up like this when I'm doing my jam jar and I haven't even mentioned medication. Yeah. You know, so I now, when I, one of the things I do when I'm, when I'm starting to go into a, I'm trying to push myself up the scale, I get my jam jar, I put it on my desk. I go through, I go through them one by one. And I do something related to the things that I know have made me feel better before. So like, you know, Burnley. I'll, I'll, when Sean Deitch was manager, I'd, I'd phone him up and say, what the f*** did you pick him for on Tuesday? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, music. I'll, I'll maybe write a piece of music for the bagpipes or, um, or I'll listen to music. The bike, go out on the bike. Mm -hmm. And things like exercise. Some days, I said this at Sheffield, some days I'm just – if I'm at a seven or an eight, I can't, I'm not going out. So I'll walk up and down the stairs for half an hour. Yeah. I don't have to face anybody, but I'll do it. I'm, I'm making myself do it. So that's where, so it's coming really, really useful. It's such a, I mean, what I love about it is it's a simple idea, but actually it highlights the complexity of all of our lives and how actually, if we embrace that complexity, realize we, we derive pleasure, well being from a whole range of sources. Exactly. Exactly. When you get into this, and I do talks in schools and stuff, and I had a, I was at a school recently, and they they wrote to me about a month later and said, we did a we did a, a lesson with the with the class, and they all wrote their jam drew their jam jars, mm -hmm. and now we've got a jam jar for the school, which they've used as their sort of statement of values, what makes yeah, yeah. the school feel good about itself, and likewise, I did a thing with an NHS trust in Surrey, and they they they've done the same, so as you say, it's a very very simple thing, but it's helped is. Look, it could be coincidence, but since I genuinely started sorting myself out, seeing somebody, medication and stuff like this, I still get depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have bad bouts, but they're not as bad as they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they don't seem to last as long. And I think it's because I've worked a lot of this stuff out. Yeah. Well, that's, that means really encouraging. And I know that just... I, so according to me, Alistair, we've got 14 minutes left, if that's okay. Until... According to you, yeah. I, I, I'm, I've got 14 minutes till I want to be in the pool. But anyway. <laughs> well, if it's one or two or three things I wanted to do before you go for your swim. Is just because you, I, the one thing I didn't realize until reading the book actually a while ago was that you had a really terrible bout of depression after you left Downing Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that was, and then, and that was, that was in the trigger, was that then the trigger really to do all this, like the jam jar, not just the jam jar, but going to see the, the, your new psychiatrist and so on. Yeah, possibly. it was. So I left in 2003 and I started in 2005. But yeah, probably, probably. Mm -hmm. it did, I mean, the, the, the depressive episode didn't last two years. But the bouts, the gaps between the bouts was getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. And then as I described in the book, I started basically, I guess you'd call it self-harming. I think when people talk about self-harming, they think of, you know, cutting yourself and all that. I was punching myself. Yeah, yeah. And it was just, and it's funny, we were out, funny, we we're out in Hampstead Heath and I was doing it in front of Fiona. Mm -hmm. And even as I was doing it, I was thinking, oh, you can't, you can't do this on your own anymore. Mm -hmm. 
you've got to you've got to face up to it and it's the best decision i ever made because you know and it's so tragic that david's um they he actually had a terrible accident on the day he retired as well um mm -hmm. so but he 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 made a big 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 difference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um just and i think it's that thing about i mean in the end everything in life is really about relationships it was something clicked between yeah. us that made me trust him completely that therapeutic alliances obviously we would talk about yeah which which you can't it's so difficult to write down isn't it yeah um, totally well my very first my very first experience with a psychiatrist apart from the one in scotland mr B dr benny who was great was a guy at the maudsley and it we just i just just wasn't good it was like i walked out halfway through i just i really took it again now it's probably my fault it's probably just you know i don't know but i just well the front of it had an advantage because as i walked out it was the first time since my breakdown that i felt a bit of life coming back into me well you made an active decision to yeah. Walk yeah. out, but I think, but there's not there's an, there's an important message there as well, which is if you are somebody who's going to see a therapist, a clinician, a psychiatrist, whoever it might be, and it hasn't worked first time, it's you have to keep trying because yeah, you will find hopefully you'll find somebody Absolutely. you click with, and hopefully that relationship works for you. Yeah. Also, just bring it back a couple of other things before we do finish. Is it okay? So this is a we're a research charity, right? So a mental health research charity. So if somebody said to you, right, you're back in power in, in Downing Street you're going to invest in mental health research. What would you see as the priorities for the, for mental health research? Have I got an unlimited budget or not? You have an unlimited budget, yes, just for you. Well, first of all, I would, I would set up an organisation that would be quite small and which would do a, a, a really detailed audit of all the mental health services in the world and of all the serious mental health research in the world. Because I don't, even though we've got that sort of American so-called Bible about, you know, mental mm. illness, I'm still not convinced that we, 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 we spread best practice far less in mental health than we do in physical health, I would yeah. say. So in a sense, I think that I, this maybe is a role for MQ, but I think that that research role is, that research of the research we've already got is fundamental. I think then I would like to see the scientific community persuaded that it is in their interests economically as well as morally, as you said earlier, to understand the enormous demand that there is for treatments and cures of various mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. So have much better public-private partnership between public and private sector on the medical research side of things. Mm -hmm. And then I think I'd like to see real um, mental health support of a kind of model, I think, in schools on what we used to do with classroom assistants. People are just part of the part of the class, part of the furniture, but they're they're you know they're they're part teaching, they're part mental health observers, but they're also they're also trained in the field. And to have that in in every school, I'd like to see probably on a voluntary basis. And and by the way, that that monitored for the purposes of research. Yeah, yeah. For what works and what doesn't, for what the the trends are. Give you an example. We, we've persuaded ourselves as a culture and as a society, most advanced societies have, that social media is, is one of the reasons for this sort of epidemic of anxiety amongst young women in particular. And it may be true. It may be true. But we don't know because we just, we make assumptions. We don't track things. We don't monitor things. We don't, we don't do the hard grind of checking things so i'd like to see that and then I, I would particularly like to see i'd like to see a tie up between our prison services and prison services in places like norway mm -hmm. denmark where they have a very different approach and see if we couldn't find ways of analyzing how we could bring that more rehabilitative and successful mm -hmm. approach into our prison service well, I agree with all of that. On the last point, I think it was a Dara McGarvey did a documentary recently yeah. on the BBC, and he actually highlighted some of those examples from from Scandinavia. Yeah. But on to so on the two other two points, really, they, they were great suggestions on the social media. Actually, stuff I, I, me and many others would say, yeah, we have to understand the rule. But the relationship between social media and mental health, it's only one factor involved in the mix. And actually, in one of our previous episodes of this podcast, we had Lucy Folks on it. And Lucy Folks from London has done work on this and is continuing to do work on that. And then on your first point, Alistair, about 
I love the idea of mapping out the services and the treatments. So MQ, we have done something like that. So um, I co-led this work, which was published in Lancet Psychiatry last year, in which we brought together 40 experts, experts from around the world. And it was looking at how do you prevent premature mortality associated with mental illness and suicide. And actually, we try to do that, but the but, but the bit we didn't do was map the services. But we looked to see what what what's the evidence for what works, and let's try and get it into practice. So they're great suggestions. Okay, in our last five minutes, I'm with you, Alistair. Try to squeeze the last couple of things in, right? So we we try and end with a couple of sort of more lighthearted things. We've had a lot of stuff there, and um, really helpful journey through your life as well as the sort of mental health landscape. Before I do the last two lighthearted things, new government coming in. Right. So what? Well, what, I hope so. Well, well, there will be a new government, right? <laughs> Obviously, it will be a new government. So Labour government comes in. You've just you've just said you've just had interviewed Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary. What's our priorities for mental health? Do you know, he said something very interesting in the interview, which is now yet. But he said, I'm not going to do that thing of banging on about parity between physical and mental health. We should just, you know, that should, we should take that for granted. His big thing was this focus on prevention. So I think, and I think if you're the Secretary of State, you know, particularly in a department like that, where the pressure is going to be so big on him politically as well as on the department, I think that's the right approach to say he's have a big goal. So I think if he set himself the goal of turning our mental health services from what we have now, which are mental illness crisis services, yep. into mental health services and have a mental health strategy, which touches on you know, other government departments, education, home office, criminal justice, all the other stuff that we know about. Climate, I think, is another one. And make that a, pre a genuinely preventative mental health strategy. That's what I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. Great. No, we're, not. we're on the same page there. It has to be cross-government. Yeah. It has to be a whole-of-government approach. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Alison. Two quick fires, and then we'll do a wrap-up. One is, thinking back when you're a younger individual, what advice would you give your 16-year-old self that drink down okay good solid advice there probably probably yeah, yeah. and read okay. more read more read more great um and then the last question then is and this is difficult i'm just thinking because you've met most of the people you've probably wanted to have dinner with so basically the, the question is a person or people living or dead famous or not famous who you would love to have a coffee or dinner with i think i go Shakespeare. Yeah, good shout, actually. Good. And why? Because I think I'd try and say something that you'd never thought of. And and you say... <laughs> I try and I try and say something and say, right, I'm going to make an observation about life, which you've never addressed in any of your plays or poems. <laughs> right. So just... Uh, <laughs> I love the lack of ambition there, Alistair. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, there's a funny, there's a funny bit talking about my, my, my psychiatrist. There's a, there's a bit in the book where... He was, uh, I can't remember what we are talking about, but it was this time when he was advising me and Fiona to to do something that we'd never done before every week. And one of the things we did was we went on a boat trip to Greenwich. And when he was reminding me that when we came back, he said, do you remember what you told me when you went to Greenwich? I don't know. I can't remember why this came up, but he said, well, I'll tell you what happened. You had a massive crash. And do you know why you had a massive crash? Because you went to Greenwich and you walked around the place and on the way back, you decided that you hadn't achieved as much in your life as Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you decided that this was, this was just, your life was a total failure. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think, Finally, catching. I'm just looking at a pile of books about Shakespeare. There, catching, finding Shakespeare, going, yeah, you know what? I've never thought of that. <laughs> right. Well, on that note, right? Huge thanks, Arthur, for joining us today in the podcast, and also Pleasure. a huge thanks for all you do for um, challenging stigma around mental health, promoting obviously mental health awareness, and obviously advocating. And we'll hope with the new government, and if it is Labour government, you will have hopefully some more influence than we may have and making sure that West Reading or whoever becomes health secretary really prioritizes mental health. So thanks so, mu uh, so much from Craig and I. No, at all. Craig and me. Let's get the grammar right here. Let's shake the building to get the grammar right. Um, <laughs> I, I, should, I won't question you. If you're, if you're trying to get um, Shakespeare to change his mind, I'll take yeah. criticism. 
it was, it was, it was it, listen, it, it was lovely to meet you in Sheffield. I thought it was a great event. Um and and all power to your elbow, both of you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Cheers. Right. Uh, Alistair.